What's up, man? How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. <laughs> I feel like I didn't sleep last night. So hence my undercover hat and uh, uh, I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Is it Warner Brothers? Is that what you're representing? Warner that is, I'm representing Warner Brothers. You guys yeah. can feel free to contact me at any time yes. or my representatives. Um, good. You know, <laughs> it's my, that my, easy. That's all you have in, to do. In my early days of pretending to be a producer, I had an office at Warner Brothers for a couple of years. You know, so I remember that. Yeah, pretending so. to be a producer well you were one well and, and until i really you do, are one you, know, you know, fake it till you make it right i was I, I faking it eventually figured out what to do but uh yeah it helped being on the lot and i love that lot it's a they've got a tricky situation right now with having to um there i think they announced every one of their features is going to be released simultaneously on uh hbo, HBO max. max yeah so a lot of very fun. upset people yeah yeah uh, it's a strange new uh, business with all this streaming and all this being released right away. And whoever's listening to this that doesn't know, a lot of movie stars and directors and producers, et cetera, not maybe not the producers so much, but the stars and uh, some directors have back end participation. Yeah. And if everything gets released at once, that really pretty much destroys that entire um, money making opportunity. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's weird. It's a weird time. I don't know why they did it. Uh, I do, but I don't, you know, I can't speak to it, but yeah, man. Um, you know, nobody gives you a, a playbook to teach you how to, you know, be a producer or a director or an actor. You know, you can go to acting class all day long, but that right. really doesn't make you a great actor. You know, that's true. It's and true. it's the same with the producing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's one of those things of where, um, Act, a lot of the acting classes don't facilitate what is actually asked of you on the job. You know, mm, uh, true. So, so, you know, there's this idea sometimes, and it, it actually, and it goes a lot into um, the dynamic of the teacher and the student. I mean, uh, we can certainly relate both from our experience. There's there's a huge difference between mentoring someone and then what I would call the kind of guru devotee relationship of which I would, I would say is potentially and quite often very toxic and destructive. Because if I, if I look at those two things, I would say the mentor is generally older. And I think that happens a lot with the guru devotee thing as well. So you're, it's the older person looking at the younger person and seeing in some way Maybe that they remind them of themselves in some way, or, or that um, you know how they were at that age in the in whatever field they're they're talking about, and they feel an incentive to um, maybe guide them through some of the minds that they experience that they that this person might be benefit to know ahead of time that they might they might hit, and so it's this type of thing of where. You, I think the mentor can see the mentee as someone who they want to, in, in a way, not only remind themselves of themselves, but they could actually go on and do greater things. It's kind of like, if you knew what I, if, if I knew what I knew at that age, I could do greater things. And now that I see you at that age and I can maybe impart some of that stuff, maybe I'd love to go see what you could go do. And it's this type of thing of helping on some level that person re, uh, realize their own potential and you're there to encourage them. And it's very much of the type of thing of I'm going to help you build your wings so you can maybe fly to places that never I was ever to fly to, but, uh, but I didn't have a mentor and maybe that would. And, and I think that's what, whereas the guru devotee thing is this type of thing of, Oh, I see you have the potential. And, and if you had the wings, you could do extraordinary things, but I hold the wings. <laughs> and, you know, if right. you follow my training and do a thing, then I might, lend you the wings at times, but I will have to watch you because it's very dangerous. You have to be careful, but you know, but all because I've got your best interest in mind, I will watch out for you and then you'll be able to do great things. But just remember, I got the wings and without me, you can't fly. And that's a big problem. <laughs> huge. Well, yeah, it's a huge problem. Yeah. We know a little bit about that. Um, did you always wish on that note? I never talked to you about this. We've never talked about it. For me, I always wished I would be able to find someone who could be my mentor in this business, <clears throat> whether it was an actor, 
But actually, as an actor, right away, I knew that was almost going to be impossible just because, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. The way yeah. actors get, yeah. they, they yeah, don't know how come they got lucky and they got yeah. a break and they're working or they're a star or they're an award winner. They just don't know. Yeah. You know, and they're afraid if they tell you something that it's going to kind of like, uh, I don't know, diminish their brand or you're going to take a job away from them. Even if you are, you know, uh, a 50 something year old white uh, guy, yeah. uh, you know, and they're, uh, you know, a 97 year old black woman or something. Yeah. Right? Ha ha. But yeah, it was always tough, but I always wished I could find someone to show me the way, but it's, it's difficult. It is and difficult. it does end up getting yeah. into what you talked about. It ends up being a really weird, um, it's an abusive relationship. It can't yeah, be I mean, really I, I, mean I, I think the discussion lends itself to power dynamics, right? Like, and, and, totally. how, and how those can become something potentially constructive or very destructive. Um, because I think when someone is in a position of perceived power and then does everything to work against that to you know deflate any kind of intimidation or or fear around like oh we can't talk as peers um, mm -hmm. then it's a really really you know uh, positive relationship but if someone's kind of on that that kind of perch and then feels they have to look down and be treated a certain way that's that's really really problematic because i mean i i can remember um uh, who was the guy the the scientology guy who was the uh, acting coach but it was like he, he had uh these classes could sell us milton could sell yeah, us milton could sell yeah. Us, yeah. And they the beverly hills say, playhouse like, like he would he would walk in everyone would have to stand and, and treat him with this reverence and it's like <laughs> Like what? You're, you're an acting coach. Like, I mean, <laughs> what? but, but that, you know, that, that does happen. And, um, you know, I, you know, I actually coach actors at times and I've got other friends of mine from acting class who've coached actors. And I think, I think that's a really interesting dynamic when you have the position of a working actor coaching people who are trying to become working actors. Cause I think you, I think that's a, that's a very valuable perspective. Again, it depends on these power dynamics, but I think people who are actually on the job and can tell you what it, what's involved in actually getting the job and what's expected on the set and kind of the whole picture are, are incredibly valuable. Whereas a lot of these acting coaches really were never working actors, really haven't been on sets and really don't understand. And- 100% agree with you. You know, so it, it creates some really codependent, unhealthy relationships. And, um, and, and henceforth, because, because there's not really any set system, like you said, how do you become an actor? You know, how do you do, do it well? There's, there's no, and there's, and there's no real um, accreditation system, you know, where you get vetted from a certain point of view, it's all kind of word of mouth. Um, yeah, it's problematic. I mean, it's really, really problematic. You know, it's, it's an art fraught form. with so, it. It is. Know, it's like, it's it like is. how do you, how do you kind of put it in a bottle or put it in a formula? I don't think you can. I don't think you can either. You know, I remember one time <laughs> you just make me laugh. This is like I don't know twenty, <clears throat> excuse me, twenty five years ago, something like that. Whatever it was, it's been a long time. And I was going to an acting class. It was in North Hollywood in a theater, and it was on the weekends. And it was like an all day thing on Saturday and Sunday. And it would run for a month. Anyway, we're, uh, at any rate, there was a break or it was a lunch break. And I was in front of the theater in the lobby and there were several actors up there talking and, you know, whatever BSing or they're on their phone or, you know. And this young guy comes in and he's from somewhere in the Middle East. I don't know. I, I, I want to say it was uh, Pakistan, I think. And he comes in, he goes, you know, is this the place, really thick accent, you know, is this the place where I come for acting? And I was like, oh, wow. I'm not, I didn't want to say anything because <laughs> I, I knew where he was coming from, you know. And uh, one of the actors started talking to him and, and his whole thing was he thought he was going to come there and he could get his certificate and then he would go to Warner Brothers <laughs> and say, I have acting. I want to be a star now. And I was like, God bless you, man. I wish yeah. it worked that way in some way, but it doesn't. And you know what else you just said that made me think of, uh, I never thought about it that way before. Uh, I, I really like you said that you brought this up, this whole power dynamic and mentoring, mm -hmm. you know, given that we were both in that crazy cult together, yeah. uh, you know, we're both very hyper 
vigilant and aware to that. I won't say sensitive to it, but fine, we're hypersensitive to it. You know, right. and I notice that power dynamic right away. I always notice power dynamics. And, you know, so many times you hear these stories of people, you know, like Harvey Weinstein raping women for years and no one says anything or Louis C.K., getting women in positions where they're vulnerable when they're looking yeah. for power yeah. and then starts to expose himself and jerk off. And um, so like, those are the extreme horrible criminal side of it. But so often I can't tell you how many times I've met, you know, assistance, personal assistance to major studio and network uh, people, or directors, producers, whatever. And it's just not a healthy relationship. And yeah. frequently I would have to sit and, <clears throat> listen to the uh, per it was frequently females mm -hmm. they just be crying they me me huh? and you're like oh my god you know what why do you do that yeah it, it 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 is fascinating because i just think on a very kind of basic almost um biological psychological level that the human psyche is predisposed to follow. You know, we're social yes. creatures. We want to belong to the herd. We want to feel accepted and those sort of things. And I, I think if you're not conscious of that, and I don't think most of us are, because you don't really think about it. And it's kind of just socially accepted behavior uh, on so many levels that there's not a lot of contemplation about it or self-reflection um, or, or, or recognition of the fact that we have these patterns and we have these kind of cycles we fall into and i think um the effort it takes to not only accept that predisposition but then choose to try to become self-empowered and, and become a leader in your own life takes a hell of a lot of effort and and fortitude and um no doubt and 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 most people kind of shy away from it and you know i think it, what's so interesting kind of about you know our um you know our cultic experience and the cultic relationships that we developed in that in the group you know eternal values um was very much based initially on the idea that we were going to become leaders and that we were going to become you know these type of people that would become empowered and 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 uh, uh you know, self-aware and, and enlightened and, and be able to be of service to our fellow man and the planet and all these great things, right? Uh, and mm -hmm. yet, and so, and, and from that point of view, I will never talk badly upon anyone in our group who, who had the courage to sign up because that, that's, a, that's an incredible opportunity that, that most of us don't think we'll ever face. And it takes an incredible amount of courage to actually accept it and go for it. You know? And even though it was a manipulation, which is the, I think the hardest part of the story is to recognize um, you know, that you've been duped. I mean, I, I love what the you know, people will say, you know, it's, it's very, very easy to get conned. And it's very, very um, difficult for someone to admit they've been conned. Oof. That's, that's where Oof. the rubber that's where the yeah. rubber meets the road because we, we get manipulated really, really easily and we end up in crazy situations. But the only way out and the only way to heal is to admit what happened. And, and it doesn't make you any lesser than because we're all, it's happened to all of us all the time. But there's this- To a greater of, or lesser degree. You're yeah. absolutely right, man. So there's yeah. this, in, this instilled fear of being transparent and being honest and taking ownership of- that journey of, of getting manipulated a lot or getting conned or getting duped. I mean, it just, it, it's, un, it's unfortunately part of the human experience, but it's also a valuable one if you choose to accept and deal with it and take ownership of it. And I think that's where a lot of us struggle. And I certainly know for, you know, like two decades in the cult um, that, I was my own worst enemy. I mean, when people would approach me, if anyone had the, like, like first of all, <laughs> things, start, things started fairly kind of um, convoluted in a wonderful new agey way. Like it was all idealistic and all kind of, it all seemed pretty good. But then along the way you start getting, you know, the, the kind of the, the paint starts chipping off 
the facade and, and you start seeing cracks and and then things flat out got weird and culty and really strange at some point. So even when I was starting to go through that journey and someone might have the courage to say, because I might be saying something to them, you know, and they're not in, <laughs> and, and they're, and they're, they're like, sorry. it sounds kind of, culty. you think it might be a cult? And I'd be like, fuck you, man. You think I'd get involved with a cult? How can you even say that? Why would you say that word? And, 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 uh, and, and I am basing that purely uh, my number one, rationale of credibility of why it's not a cult is because I am in the group and I have convinced myself out of sheer arrogance based on total ignorance that if I'm in the group, it can't be cult. <laughs> and I've got this idea of who gets in cults and it's not me. So the fact that I'm in the group, so I'm cool. Yeah. Can't be a cult, you know, it's can't that be a cult. So yeah. But it's called self-referencing 101. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm I, a master I, at it too. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I just think we become our own worst enemy that way. And, and, um, and, and you and I have, have, have seen this in, in some of our compatriots who were in the group who have a very hard time accepting or admitting that there were some really, really nasty, abusive things going on. There's, yes. there's still this desire to sugarcoat things and 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 censor and um, revise history to maintain this concept that oh it was just it was just a um, another stepping stone on my path to spiritual awakening of some sort you know which listen on some level yeah on that's some true. level it is that yeah. that's true right but right. but on another level there's some really fucked up abusive crazy shit that went down and if you can't just call a spade a spade, I don't think you're doing anyone any benefit, and certainly yourself. Um, now, not everyone is gonna choose the path like you or I to wanna to talk about it. And you know, I certainly would, I mean, if I'm being in the cult, I don't, I'm not interested in telling anybody what, what to do or what would help them, or if I have any idea what would be best for them, because that, that is so, I think, inappropriate for anyone to do at any time. I'm sure it's, it's brutal as a parent, you know, looking at your kids, you probably want Oh, you know, to save them from the pain that you went through on some level, but the pain you went through is what built the person who you are. So, are right, are you really contributing to your child's growth to have them avoid the thing that actually helped build the character that you are? I mean, it's it's a tricky situation. I've never been a parent. I don't. Uh, I, I I really admire people who do do it, and I don't say that I could do it well. But it's um, it's a challenging situation. I can see the dynamic there, and I and I witnessed it just even in our group with this lack of acceptance to just be straightforward about the truth and, um, and let the chips fall where they may. Uh, mm -hmm. and, that's, and, and that's, again, going back to those power dynamics, you know, the, the, the idea that we bought into, again, like I said, I feel so um, impressed by any one of us who signed up for that, you know, because it was a great idea. Now, what it actually was is something very, very different. And, oh, yeah. and, and, and to swallow the pill, the medicine, to go back and say, from that first moment when I met the guy, Freddie, the guru, the, you know, the cult leader, whatever way you want to label him, um, the Messiah, as some might. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the walk-in, the archetype. Yeah, exactly. Uh, on some level, that's when the manipulation and the coercion was beginning. And, and I won't even necessarily give him the credit, to, you know, and I mean, Freddie, that, that he knew what he was doing because I just think his coping mechanisms had become so pathological that I don't know if he was even aware of just how his coping mechanisms were so destructive and diabolical to others. I'd I think, agree with that. You know, there was such a need so, yeah. for attention and, and he had been so wounded and you know, and, and, and quite honestly, I don't have to know, you know, uh, and, and I think, you know, uh, and this is kind of an interesting segue into um, some of the things that are being put out there right now, as far as on this subject matter of mm -hmm. cult, cultic groups and those type of things of, um, I think, and I'm so grateful for this, that, that, that the filmmakers are starting to learn there's a great benefit to keep the cult leader in their actual position in the story, which is the antagonist, 
don't make them the protagonist. Like don't, don't make them the focus of your story because how relatable, let's hope not many, are, are many viewers gonna be to someone who is basically a narcissistic sociopath? Exactly. And, you know, it's fascinating to try to figure out what makes those people you know, tick, but is that really being very constructive as far as our own personal life experience? Because the things that I feel we relate to on a human level are others who suffer th wounds that we have. I think people bond a lot more strongly over pain than the good times, so to speak. And um, no doubt. And if you tell the story through the so-called victims, you know, you know, trying to find their way to become transformed from a victim into a survivor, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, which is very much kind of the classical hero's journey, right? Um, I think. You know, I think that's really a powerful storytelling because now most people can relate to being in these power dynamic, you know, relationships where you've given away your power to someone else and you've really suffered and been abused and been controlled and been manipulated and coerced to do things or say things that you never thought you'd ever do or say. And, uh, and that's a very, very powerful, relatable story. Um, and the only thing I'll add to that is component I feel that gets missed and something that I know you and I have talked about, Dar, the most important component to the story. And, and, and if we, and I referenced earlier, the hero's journey uh, is the, the hero at some point experiences all these trials and tribulations and comes to some awakening. You know, there's a, a point of transformation, but the, the third act is taking that new found perspective or the lessons learned or as they like to call it the elixir you know this this thing that you've gained from the journey and and take and you take it back to um the uh the people and and to your community and you share and tell the tale tale and and that is a way to describe the recovery process you know you take ownership of your story you tell it with the best means possible and you try to foster conversations so everyone learns. And, um, and it's not about saving people or helping people per se, because people really help and save themselves, but the way they do that is by getting information. So if you can get them information or, or maybe package something in a way that, that, that is more user-friendly or, or more um, a new, twist on, on, on how things can be looked at, then that could be, you know, potentially provide them with information that they can self-reflect on and maybe make healthier choices in their life based on that new perspective. And I think that's something really awesome. And I, and I find a lot of the, the, the stories we've seen in the media, they started to make the shift to start to tell it from the victim's point of view, but they really haven't captured that recovery side. You know, it's the type of thing of, the this, this show kind of ends with, well, we got the bad guy or the bad, you know, the cult leader, he right. died or it's, I mean, it's over with, but it's, it's not really capturing like the critical part of the tale, which is, um, and I might've said this in our other podcast, but as, as tough as the cult life, cult group dynamic, whole cult, you know, day in, day out experiences. I mean, it's a pretty rough, shitty, um, abusive, agonizing uh, experience. But from a certain point of view, it's pretty simple because there are rules and granted they're changing all the time, which is part of the manipulation, but there are set rules that you're constantly trying to follow. And it's pretty basic. Like either you follow the rules and you're, you can move up the food chain and be kind of acknowledged and admired uh, or you don't and you're in trouble and you're getting punished like a motherfucker. So right. um, it's, it's very much this black and white thing, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and I certainly have learned that life is really about shades of gray, but in that cultic environment, that is, it's very black and white. And mm -hmm. so coming out of that as horrific as it is to get, you know, and so, and how great it is to get away from it, the real challenge, and I would say the harder part of the journey is now trying to not only make sense of what happened and beginning with how did I even get involved with this, which of course everyone wants to ask, right? 
Yeah, right. And, and you got to answer that for yourself first, right? And true. And, and that and, and that was one of the key components of you and I connecting because um, I, I think, quite honestly, I, I can I can I'll, I'll probably go to my grave saying if if we had not connected at that time, I I cringe to think where where I would be today, and if if I would have had any real success in figuring things out, you know? Um, so my brother that is very, interesting. Very man. grateful Thank for that. You. But Thank you. I, I am too. I am very grateful. Because honest to God, if we hadn't, you know, lived together, we shared an apartment, a two bedroom apartment, in West yeah. LA. And if we hadn't have done that, I mean, you know, because I was the same guy. I, I you know, you're saying, yeah. you're saying all this stuff. It's great. I'm just going to shut, shut up and let you go because it's, it's great, but you're hitting. Well, well, you know the thing that the thing that was all great, these beats. The thing that was great about it was um, we both clearly had arrived to a point where we you know there was a degree of desperation. You know, I mean, um, Oof, uh, I think that's an understatement I think of the it day. Was pretty obvious that we were both unhappy, and. Uh, <laughs> um, but I'd but like to up mine to miserable. Like yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. But misery loves company, right? And and, wow. and and so there there was some some again here people bond over pain, right? So there was yeah. some kinship of just knowing at least you and I knew the players, and at least if we wanted to, we could be heard in a very different light than you or I trying to tell someone else about what happened, right? That's right. So, so that was a, that was such a special sauce. And, and I can, uh, you know, and I thought about this a lot and, and, and I love the way we just entered into it very gingerly. of just trying to de starting to deconstruct some stuff of like, Hey, you do you remember when, um, when, when, when that time, when this and this happened, you're like, yeah, I'm like, it's kind of weird. Right. <laughs> you're like, yeah. <laughs> what do you think was going on there? And we would talk about it. Right. And, and for the first and, time ever, by the way, for the first time in 20 years, we had the freedom and the space was, was created where we could talk about it, which right. like, as we sit here and talk about this, like, really how fucked up were you guys? We were that fucked up. <laughs> yeah. That's no, exactly no, how fucked no, up. That's, that's exactly right. And, 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 and even at that point, you know, I was still, caught up in the idea that I was the bad one, you know, and that I had somehow failed or was lesser than I had not measured up. I couldn't fulfill the task that was at hand. And I so think there, I would have, like, I was trying to convince you that I might've failed even bigger. I don't know. It was like, a con yeah, well, <laughs> we, no, we're I, both I, in that. No, I, I think, it, no, I mean, no, we, we had those conversations because, oh, yeah. um, uh, you know, you know, just, just like from chips in the game, it's like you had left twice. I'd only left once, you know, it's like, you know, you, you know, it's like, uh, you know, we, we could go tick for tack on certain things. And, and, but uh, I actually got kicked out the first time to a, a, a girlfriend of mine says, who the fuck gets kicked out of a cult? And I just <laughs> me. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, it, it, and and it's interesting because there, there's only three ways you get out of a cult. You know, either you leave, either someone pulls you out, you know, or you get kicked out. And I would say either of those last two is probably the rougher of the rides. And I would say probably the most intense one mm -hmm. is getting kicked out. You know, because uh, I don't know about that. Kick, well, kicked out was brutal, but but you're right. You know, it's either you get kicked out, you get extracted, or you right. have to. You said leave. I mean, you're being very nice. It's you have to like you did. You yeah, escaped, escaped under the cover of I night. Escaped, yeah, yeah. I escaped. Yeah. I had to do. I I didn't have the luxury of, or at least I didn't think I did of under cover of night. So I put yeah. my thinking cap on and I was like, how do I make these guys think that this is their idea that I get out of dodge? Which is brilliant. Which is well. Brilliant. Thank you, but I mean, <laughs> no, but 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 I tell you, and that's and I think what's 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 amazing about that is recognizing that when we're in dire situations, situations we would never imagine we find ourselves, and it mm -hmm. it uh, it appears hopeless. Of course, mm -hmm. there's always room for hope, and that you know this is where 
uh, not to get esoteric, but this is where like the, the, the tiny kind of human spirit finds some way and it may be, you know, in retrospect, convoluted and, and ludicrous on some level, but it's some sort of psychological angle that, that you can figure out that you can spend it in such a way where you, it's okay for you to do this thing that you need to leave. Like I thought I was doing the group a favor by leaving. I, I was cutting. Oh, really? Oh yeah. I was cutting out the dead weight and the oh, hopeless, yes. hopeless cause that was holding them back. You know, they were having to spend all these hours and I mean, hours and days, you know, reprimanding me because I was just so out of control and resistant and resentful that uh, it, had, it had dawned in my mind at that time that, that uh, I was unfixable. And yet, because I had empowered them as being the true seeker, that they were never going to stop trying. But I knew in my heart of hearts, it was a, a lost cause. And the greatest benefit I could do, it would be to extract and re relieve them of that dead weight so they could spend their time doing something much more constructive than dealing with a loser like me. So that was how I rationalized um, being able to uh, to leave, and uh, I, mean, I wish you know people ask is like you know I wish that I was able to uh, just come up you know and tell you in the morning I woke up one in the middle of the night and went oh you know I think I'm in a cult I should probably get the hell out of here and had some great epiphany and like like bolted it's like not even close man <laughs> not even close. I'm la I'm trying not to laugh because you're you're you know you're 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 telling the truth first of all, and there is a lot of pain behind that, and um, and I mean it's great that I can laugh about it now, but you know there oh, were yeah. times like no, listen, you can I'll laugh you, about it. Well, I mean, and again, luckily we both have a sense of humor, and I think that was a key component to us figuring this thing out. Like it was so intense, and and some of the epiphanies oh we were God. and things we were stringing together that if we didn't have the ability to take a deep breath and laugh. I mean, I think we would have both jumped off the bridge. <laughs> and, hmm. uh, and, um, and so I, that's a key component to the healing process. You said a mouthful, man, you know, it, it, it's, um, you know, there've been a lot of these cult uh, documentaries popping up on, on TV, Netflix and, and uh, Amazon prime. And, and I think and Hula H had one. HBO did one, the vow. And and, HBO. Yeah. Correct. Right. The vow, right. With the guy that the, the Nexium, right. That guy just out of his mind. Um, but they always want to get into the salacious part, which is what I always, always push back to you. I was like, dude, do you really want to talk about this? Cause yeah. they're going to call you cult baby forever. And you said, no, I got to talk about it. And, um, well, I'm like, well, all they're going to want to know is like sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah, of course. And then the, yeah. and it's like, okay, yeah, there is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. There's no question. Cause like, how are you going to keep someone's attention? But then after that, and that's, those are fleeting little pops of, 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 you know, on, on the timeline, the, the, the slog of it is what you're talking about, which is recovery. And look, man, nobody wants like the whole system, our whole society, our whole world, no matter where you are listening to this, it's not set up for us to be introspective. Like, like Hoyt was just saying, and to go back and reevaluate your belief system and what is your value systems? And are you living in accordance with those, you know, or are you getting manipulated by someone else for their gain and your detriment or I mean maybe it's not quite detriment but you're not even in the equation you're just a chess piece a pawn to them and so no one wants to talk about it, no one wants to think about it and you and I've always been like well yeah but you know honest to god man the real story and the and the true humanity is like it's in there yeah I, I mean the, the the truth is recovery is not sexy <laughs> No, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's 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 a lot of hard work, but it, it's it's you know these cultic relationships, um, and I and I and I I think we might have talked about it in our our first talk, but um, they're universal. It's a universal experience, and the sure is. cult, you know, which is more uh, you know adds in this group dynamic as we were talking about the power dynamics that go on, but. You know, it takes it's it's an extreme version of it, but the truth is we are all experiencing cultic relationships, but we are not necessarily recognizing or understanding the accurate nomenclature. You know, that's actually the clinical appropriate term for the relationship you've had, and and it's this kind of relationship of where 
you've in essence, you know, given your power away because because you're seeking approval or, or love from a person or, or uh, accommodation in some way, attention. And by giving away that power, the person takes advantage of it. It is in some way controlling and potentially abusing you. Right. And that is the cycle. That is exactly it. And, and it falls under the, 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 the umbrella of codependence and those sort of things. But there's, there's a, um, there's a symbiotic thing that happens. And, it, and it's really, as I was saying earlier, you become your own worst enemy because because you don't recognize what's happening. And, and very often there is a bait and switch involved. And what I mean by that, in a lot of these type of cultic relationships, the person we're drawn to in many ways is incredibly charismatic and charming and, and can do some form of kind of compliments and adoration towards you, that's really intoxicating and kind of throws us all off balance and we get kind of snowed by that. And, um, and it's almost like a drug fix, like you want more of it. And that becomes this really dangerous dynamic that starts, um, you start wanting this thing that's not actually real, but initially felt like it might've been and felt good. And you, and you talk, you see, you see it most commonly in you know love relationships where someone you know a guy meets a girl you know who just knocks his socks off or a guy a girl meets a guy who knocks her socks off and they're just in this bubble of love and whole thing and and then you check in with them a year or two down the, the line if they're still together and something really nasty is going on and they're still clinging to those early days when they were in where they just had these feelings that actually have been disproven over and over again, over the time that's passed. And yet we cling on to those first moments because they seem so fantastical. And the, and the truth is a lot of times they aren't real. And, and, that, and that's, and it's, again, it's our reluctance to accept that on some level we were duped. And no one's to blame for that other than ourselves. And Quite honestly, you're not alone. So it's not a big admission, but that's where a lot of the resistance comes from as if you're gonna somehow look lesser than because you got duped by somebody, but I haven't met anyone in life who hasn't been duped in some way. So <clears throat> why it can't just be a, a common conversation and something we could all kind of encourage and empathize and, and empower each other because this is something we can all relate to. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You know, um, you man, you're 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 breaking it down nicely. It's 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 interesting, you know. It is. Um, it happens a lot more often than people think, and it's not always, you know, like ours was. This started off being this, like I don't know. I say pseudo religious because it really wasn't. He just kind of took a mishmash of everything. But it doesn't have to be yeah. a religious cult. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, something like that. It can, it can it be, be any it, whatever. It can be, it can be self help. It can be political. It, it can just be business. I mean, you know these these multi-level, you know, businesses. I mean, you know, the, the thing that's, you know, we, we talk about that, um, that initial kind of, uh, the term they use a lot of times is love bombing, you know, this, this kind mm -hmm. of intoxication that can come over when someone kind of is, is, is snowing you to some degree. Right. And, uh, and, um, you know, that's a really, really powerful drug. And there's this guy, I'm trying to think of this name's like Yuval, uh, Laor, I think he's a he's a brilliant guy, but he talks about it in the terms of awe, you know, A W E or fervor, and how that is a very tangible, real thing um, that we experience. And you sometimes we experience it in church. We might maybe in a like in a big crowd football game or a concert. You know, this there's this energy. This gr it's a group experience that you feel, and it's tangible. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, you know, the way he describes it, it's, it's, it's literally a mini seizure in your brain. <laughs> you know, there's, there's literally a disconnect that occurs in that heightened state, um, which is very hard to replicate because it's not something you can personally control. And there's this desire to recapture it. And because of that desire to recapture it, we make allowances and accept things that aren't good, just hoping we're going to get back to that state and it's a yeah. really really destructive dynamic that 
we're not even conscious happens. And, and I think for me, and a lot of this process, obviously there's been a lot of therapy and consulting and, and, a, and a psychological emotional work, but it's also been really helpful to recognize on some level, the brain physiology and just how we operate as humans and under stress, how our brain gets affected and, and gets influenced depending on what we're up against. And, um, you know, one of the things that we experienced in the cult is what we'd call the hot seat, right? And, and the hot seat for your viewers out there, um, yes. the situation of where there would be a buildup to it normally that, that, that at some point someone in the group was um, determined by some of the higher ups because the group, the group kind of works like a mob. So you kind of have the kingpin and there's a few higher ups. And so some of the people in the higher echelon have dictated that person A uh, is not representing the principles we're trying to live by on some level as <laughs> bogus as that sounds but, exactly uh, you know th but so there's this idea that this person's um in, in in essence misbehaving and they need to be corrected or whatever way you'd want to term it so but there's this first step of saying you've seen this right and so that everyone's eyes as a group starts focusing on this person and their potential flaws, you know, and, and looking for behavior. Certainly through that lens, through yeah, that lens. Looking for behavior mess. that supports that point of view, right? That point of view, right. And, and classic like any, circular reasoning. Like, it, like anything, you can look, you can watch anyone under the microscope and they're going to do plenty of things that you can criticize, you know? So, so that would become the, 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 the initial stage leading up to the moment when this person would finally be confronted, that they, they would literally be sat in a seat and the mob, you know, and it could be anywhere from 15 to 20. And sometimes it was like 45. I mean, um, those were the days, man. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, and you, you don't know really, until you've been grilled be by 45 verbally assaulted. Uh, and, and, you know, at times just flat out screamed at. Um, and it was incredibly damaging, incredibly abusive. It was incredibly terrifying. Um, now the, the crazy thing about it, as awful as it sounds for the person who's on the hot seat, which is, and I can, you know, darn, I can both uh, vouch for it, is an awful place to be. There was also this crowd mentality, mob mentality in the, in the, in the group that, if you did not throw rocks, if you did not pile on, if you did not have something to contribute to validate the points that were being made, in an instant, the swarm could turn towards you because the leader could look at you and say, why haven't you said anything? Exactly. And you'd be like, and he'd go, because you're exactly the same. And now no. it's like, <laughs> the group is on you and now it's just bombs away. So, so, that element always existed. So sometimes, I mean, I remember, and I'm not proud of this. I remember like digging up or even manufacturing shit just so I could say something to avoid that happening to me. So I would pile on to the person who was getting pummeled just so I would feel safe. And, you know, those are things that, that I just have to live with. I'm not proud of, but I also realized like that was a survival mechanism in an incredibly abusive, crazy environment that I never thought I'd find myself in. So a lot of the recovery process is understanding how those things happen, how these power dynamics develop and, and, and how dangerous these groups can be when you have these type of power structures. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and basically that's how I, I was able to, on some level, forgive myself because when you start to study and understand it, you go, you know what? Yeah, I am not proud about what I did or, 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 or what, I, what I didn't stop or what I said or, or what I didn't say, you know, all those type of things. But anyone else facing the same scenario I was facing? Would have done the same I thing, man. Got to believe, yeah, they would have done kind of the same thing. So that's, that's where I find some solace. Like it's, it's not because my parents didn't love me enough or not that I – you know, didn't win that trophy uh, for whatever. And I, none of that stuff matters. You know, we, we, we get thrust into situations sometimes that we, we never thought we'd find ourselves, but, um, 
But when we do, if we're not conscious of how things work, we're kind of locked into behaving a certain way, which in retrospect is probably something you're not going to be particularly proud of, but True. that's how, that's how True. we learn, you know, that's True. how we learn. Yeah. It's, it's a crazy dynamic and it's, um, uh, I'll do my own little solo piece on this. I won't get into it now, but that's kind of really what's happening. It's not kind of, it's what's happening with um, our government right now and uh, with Trump and all of his supporters. And you just laid out exactly how a person can get caught up in that and keep getting fed disinformation, misinformation, getting gaslit. Um, and then they end up storming the Capitol last week. And now all of a sudden things come crashing down. A, he said right before we stormed the Capitol, he was going to come with us. Well, he didn't do that. B, I'm getting beaten and arrested by federal police officers, Capitol police officers, National Guardsmen, whatever. And now I'm in federal court looking at potentially 45 to 100 years. Mm -hmm. And yeah. like everything changes. And so I'm not condemning those people. I certainly don't agree with them. But, but to your point, um, I look at those situations and I, you know, people are like, why aren't you saying anything? Some friends of mine um, that know me and know about, you know, what we've gone right. through, we're talking about today. And it's like, because, you know, I know this may sound cliche and trite, but there, but for the grace of God, go I. Because motherfucker, I was this close to doing crazy shit like oh, that. Yeah. Um, right after where, when you and I first got the, uh, the place together, right. There was the, uh, heaven's gate. Yeah. You know, uh, and those, they all got together and put on their, well, no, that was, Nikes. Well, no, that was, no, that was not um, heaven's gate. Sorry. That was heaven, uh, no heaven. No heaven's gate. That is, but, but that was, um, I just watched the show. It was 97. So that was before us just before us. Right. My bad. Right. But well, they I all did at, the jello I, shots of cyanide I, I, or whatever. Yeah. I was actually, I mean, this is, this is an interesting, um, uh, tangent on that but it, it, it kind of tells you the cult mentality i remember because i was still involved with the group at that time and uh and i remember when that happened and there was discussions in our group of oh it's so terrible you know these people got caught in a cult and look what they did if they oh, don't really if they'd only met people like us they could have maybe been saved and <laughs> and so it's interesting that you're in a cult, but you can recognize other cults as cults and that they're dangerous, but they're not you. You're the truth, but they're the bad ones. And that, there's, and that's, that's how caught you, you are. You just described humanity yeah, right there. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I remember, I remember when the Vanity Fair article came out, and this was in 1990, that basically there's a 15 page article that exposed our group as a cult, called it a cult. And, um, and uh, made allegations of certain crazy behavior that was going on, which a lot of it was very true. Um, so it was this kind of PR nightmare for our group. And in desperation, I remember I got a book, um, not a great book, but it was a, a, about cults and it had this kind of list. And so I'm going through the list of, of these kind of points that are in cults and, and um, where were you at the time? Were you in North Carolina, New York? No, I was in New job? York. I was still in New York at that time. And uh, okay, but I'm going through the list, and it was it was maybe a, a dozen things, and, and at least half of them I could tick off. Going, we do that, but the perspective I had was not, oh my God, we might be a cult. My perspective was, oh. This is why people could think we're a cult. Oh, I get it. So then I brought this information to the group and we had this big conversation of, okay, listen, we know we're not a cult, right? Come on, of course. But people think we're being called that. And since some of these things we do do, let's try to minimize our cult-like behavior so that just people see for us for what we are because we're not a cult. And that's how we started to operate. <laughs> what the actual fuck did you just say wow i never so knew that's that. how level you how deep your level of denial can be like Correct. you again you cannot swallow i've been duped pill you know you'll just you'll fight so hard to not get there and and we've seen it right now with you know with you know we you know we occasionally talk to some of the ex-members and there's still some you know some real hardcore loyalists who 
are still carrying the flag and saying it was all for truth, valor, and the you know American or cosmic intergalactic way. You know. Yeah, you know, I reached out. I yeah, yeah. It's you know, I always two things come to my mind. I always because of what you just said, I never heard that that story before. But you know, I went I went through the same you know dynamics the in my mind. Uh, I never, I always tell people never underestimate the power of denial or the stupidity of a mob or a group of people, an individual, like one-on-one -on -one, yeah, you and I, right. you're a sensitive, thoughtful, lovely, beautiful, sentient being. Put a group of those thoughtful, sentient, beautiful human beings together. Yeah. And I'm telling you, all you have to do is just know exactly where the flashpoint is put a little bit of accelerant in a, in a match, yeah, you know, yeah, and yeah. boom, people are doing things they can't imagine. So yeah, but, and again, never that, underestimate that, that. That's that fervor thing. That's, that's that, that fervor, thing. correct. That, that is, that yeah. is that, and, and you literally check out. It's like, like I said, it, he goes, it's like a mini seizure. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really, really it's powerful, man. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I did what you did. I, I started, you know, you, you know, in the beginning, you say you can't blame, like, I don't blame my parents because, you know, I didn't get loved enough or I didn't win the trophies. There's a, there's, there is that element. But after, after you get past that and own that, talk about not wanting to own and admit you mm -hmm. or you have any responsibility, because that's really what we're getting at. What's yeah. my responsibility? Because no matter what happens to us in our lives, the one common denominator in each you of our there. lives yeah correct <laughs> so no matter where you it, go there you are right there you are buckaroo yeah. love that man buckaroo bonsai great no matter where you go there you are so um you can find yourself doing stupid shit and then i found out through studying neuroscience uh that you know the the limbic system you know that deepest part of your brain that really hasn't evolved over the last few million years of us being a species you have three decisions that are made in a microsecond. And it's, do I fight this or do I flee this? Do I kill this and eat this? Uh, or do I have sex with it? Mm -hmm. And that happens rapid fire. So to your point, you know, if you get up in a mob thing, and oh, lock her up, yeah, lock right. her, you lock her up. Well, you can right. just, cool, because survival is our key, our number one thing. And that's where that's all born out of. And so if I don't have to think about that, just say, lock her up. Or if I don't have to think about that and turn on you and go, yeah, Hoyt. And mm. furthermore, you know, you part your hair on the wrong side. And that means you're a, you know, whatever, right. whatever right. retarded thing would come up. That's how that stuff happens. And it happens instantaneously. And so, like you said, life is shades of gray. In the cold, everything's black or white. Well, when you start to work your way back out of this, like we've been talking about the recovery process, you realize nothing's black or white. Right, exactly. It's just not. I mean, and this is going to get a lot of people's, you know, upset. Okay, fine. But, you know, think about this. It's not right or wrong, up or down. I mean, there, it, is, it is that. But really, if we look more closely at any situation, thing, place, relationship, event, there are so many layers of things going on. And yeah. You know, for me, when I realized all that, I was like, well, I need to increase my awareness. I didn't really think about it that way, but I started to meditate and that right. helped me yeah. massively. You know, it's helped me massively, but um, yeah, man, things can go sideways really quickly and it's not, it, there's, there, there's always fault. There's always blame, but you know, you, I always have to stop and remind myself, well, look, motherfucker, you were there. So you were yeah. a part of it, yeah. even if you yeah. didn't start well, it. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, when I see the extremism, you know, you know, and, and listen, it, it's on in politics, it's on the right and the left. You know, you, you, totally. you've got totally you've got obviously a cultic group around Trump. And then you have the anti Trump group, which is as equally guilty of just extremism, you know, and and so the you know it, it 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 comes back to well where are the people in the middle where are the moderate where are the, where's some balance in all this like ultimately yeah, I remember talking to to someone who was highly political and I'm like um, you know if we go to war they give guns to both Democrats and Republicans like at the end of the day we're all on the same side right I mean and and, and I think people lose sight of that and and but the fervor comes from creating the enemy right i mean that's that's the whole 
you know, that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. You gotta have what, cause I, I, I think, and this is one of the things where culturally succeed in um, pulling people in. I think we all want to feel so strongly about something in our life, you know, something within our, that we feel are, is our values that we'd be willing to die for. Uh, yeah, think, that's a yeah, very, very powerful hook. That, if we feel we've arrived at that place, I think that that's when you start thinking to yourself, I really feel alive. Like I've got a moral compass, I've got some priorities. And, and um, which, which I think, you know, is a great feeling if you if you arrive there but if you've been manipulated into there because the feeling's great but if it's not actually your own <laughs> making as far as that you right. know the, you know, if, if you're fighting for someone else's cause or someone else's dream and it's not really yours then you're in a really dangerous situation and that's where i think we kind of found ourselves like like we didn't create the the map that freddie von mears has created of how the world worked he created, we bought in and then it became our cause. And that's why it was so damaging because it really wasn't our, our take on the world. You know? right. and, and we yeah. weren't asked really what that was. We were told what it was. And if we really tried to question or fight it, boy, you suffered some serious consequences. And uh, yeah, you're talking about, you know, there's a guy named Simon Sinek and he's you know become pretty popular. His thing is, why what's your why oh yeah i love what I, I, yeah i love that yeah he's it terrific. is it's great that, guy. that guy's but, terrific. and that's yeah that's one of the that's that's a main driver in in a person's life and so you know necessarily at different stages in our life people are like i don't even know what i'm doing anymore yeah that's a dangerous place to be right own it welcome it sit in it and realize it but be aware that you're in that kind of nether world and you're not feeling uh, strong and you're not making clear and clean and smart decisions and choices because you know that's how you get like I said that is that that's the hook yeah you go in there yeah. and so like uh, in, the, in the group we were in it was it was pretty much that we we're grooming leaders for the new age <laughs> and that really you know that really well, of course I mean, on, right our, yeah exactly right <laughs> just look at me I mean look at you come on <laughs> Yeah, yeah that's know. yeah, that's where we should be. Jeez. But you know, it strokes your ego in a way that you like when you're in your 20s. And it, you know, these messages can be different. It's not you know, cults don't just happen when you're young and in your 20s. It can happen at any age. But um, if you don't have a strong why, if you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, and what the greater purpose is, what your bigger end game, your biggest outcome is, totally, um, you can get you can get taken and twisted and turned around. Yeah. And our desire, our social being, you know, this social, this pandemic has really shown me just how social an animal I am. I always knew I was, but I didn't realize how much I need that. Yeah. And um, so our desire to fit in and be social, even if, you know, Freddie Myers wacky why yeah. makes no sense. But if I say something, I'm going to get lambasted in the chair, you know, and slammed and screamed at for two, three hours from, you know, midnight till three or four in the morning. Absolutely. I'll just go along with the crowd. I'll yeah. just keep my head down and won't say anything. So it's the line of least resistance, you know, and, and then I think the other thing that you know, you're talking about when, when we're at those points where we feel like we're a little lost and we're, we feel like you said, maybe we're not making great decisions or, or we don't really have a game plan or, or, you know, we haven't discovered a passion or whatever those things that's where, and listen, that. Welcome to the human condition. Like that happens, all of us. Right on. Hopefully, at some point, you know, uh, because it's an opportunity for growth, right? There you go. Uh, and I think a lot of people call that, you know, maybe their seeker moment or a searching mode of some sort. Um, hey, can which, I interrupt real quick? Do you get called a seeker ever? Not commonly, no. But people uh, called you that though. I have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, because oh, I, I, I self reference it that from the point of view of even like you just said, from the why. Like, why am I here? What am I supposed to do with my life? Yeah. Why should I care? You know, all those sort of things. Uh, right. So I think the thing that's fascinating about that transitional period that, that occurs, I think, in everyone's life at, at some point, if not multiple times, 
is that if you voice it to someone else, generally you'll be met with real encouragement. Like, oh, that's awesome, man. I'm sure you, you're going to figure it out. And that's, you know, really going to pat in the back and which, which is valid. But I think it also needs to be tempered by people going, bro, that's great, but be careful because every manipulator and con artist out there is going to see you as a target because you are open and receptive and trying to discover stuff and they can sniff you out like you've got a target on your back and incredible. no one tells you that you know and, and yeah. because it is a great period but you do need to operate with caution because as you just said as you just said you're so vulnerable and 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 the, and, and it's misplaced desire you there's such a disease to um, desire to want something answered that if you perceive that someone else is providing those answers, um, that seems like a wonderful moment. But if they know anything about control and manipulation or mind, you know, mind uh, uh, control techniques, you won't see it happening. Like, like you and I experienced it. Like mind control works on everyone. You just have to be receptive. So if you're at that point in your life where you're receptive, but no one's told you to be careful, that's the perfect storm. And if you come across someone who can take advantage of that, then you're kind of screwed. And, um, you know, and that's so, the truth, man. That's the truth. You know, and the, and, uh, and that's where the story all kind of unfolded, you know? Yeah. A hundred percent. And, you know, you got an early start, you know, yeah. he met you as a teenager right. on the beach in Nantucket. And then, you know, the next thing you know, you're up in New York and he's like buying beers and coming to well, visit. Well, he's like, he's like, you know, we're going to Studio 54. I mean, yeah, as 18 years old. Yeah. And that was granted. It was the second wave of Studio 54. I, I didn't I missed the first wave, which I heard was really. But for me, I mean, it was literally like walking through the looking glass into Alice in Wonderland. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. What was going on? And mm -hmm. um, and again, that's that's a form of awe. You know, and and uh, it's very it was, seductive, man. Yeah, and uh, and I certainly didn't think, oh, a, a potential cult leader is taking me to Studio Fifty Four and introducing me to all these sexy women. <laughs> all over the, I'm like, oh yeah, that's what you need to look for in a cult leader. Like, I didn't think that worked out, but you know, I can vouch. <laughs> yeah, for they it. don't have. That's how it happened. So, right, right. Yeah. That's not in the playbook, but that's how it happened. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was a crazy time. Started out in New York moved down to North Carolina, at which point Freddie had died. And that's when the, the uh, was that, it was 90, right? Yeah, Freddie and died February of 90, yeah. Of 90, and then I think the, the uh, Vanity Fair uh, Article came, out. Came, out the, came out five, five days, five days after he died, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. I, I still remember when I, I just happened to walk into a 7-Eleven and I saw it. There's Freddie's picture in the bottom of corner of Vanity Fair. It says, you know, alien cult for Mark Turris or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Like, East Side Alien or something. Yeah. Something know. like that. My head just went yeah. kaboom. Wow. Uh, yeah, it's it, it's a uh, it's an interesting, weird, wild, fascinating thing. Uh, and you know, uh, you touched on this, and I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd get there. But when I, you know, sitting here now. I'm so grateful to have gone through it. It was painful beyond belief, um, dangerous beyond belief. And of course it was like a lot of wild and crazy times. You and I still know each other out of this, which is no small feat. Yeah. Um, I'm just grateful for the whole thing because it's, you know, like you said, you and I have, tr have, have tried to talk to people who were in that, in the group and, you know, various stages um, over the past, 20 years and some have been receptive to talk and admit that it's a cult more don't want to have that conversation and have varying degrees of, you know, complete shutting down or the screaming and yelling match with you mm. or uh, they start to gaslight you, you know? Yeah. And uh, you know, you and I were talking this summer and I had this idea, just this idea ran through my head for um, a picture book, uh, from back in the day during those right. times. And I thought, well, maybe I could reach out to some of the, you know, guys and the girls that were there and see if they had any photos or something. That might be an interesting little thing to do. And <laughs> I reached out and talked to a few people and, 
wow. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I don't want to talk at a turn because, you know, they're not here to, to rebut my, my, uh, my words or my, my uh, impression, my memory of it. Um, but yeah, man, it, I, I'm laughing at it because parts of it are really funny. Uh, but if I'm going to be honest, it's really, it's sad. Yeah. It's, no, it's tragic. It is. It's tragic. I mean, that, we, 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 you know, we all got traumatized and, uh, you know, you and I have talked about it. I mean, trauma yep. does not go away. And, uh, but if you deal with it, you can manage it really well. And it can actually be something that could be a wonderful reference point that could become really empowering and kind of yeah. direct us towards um, a, hopefully avoiding anything like of that type of trauma coming, coming again. Right be giving perspective and empathy towards others who are also been traumatized, you know, and recognizing that this is also part of the human condition. Right. And um, mm -hmm. so no one gets away with a free lunch, but uh, it only begins to uh, heal if you own up to it and, uh, and start talking about it, which yeah. is, you know, in, in, in a kind of a meta view here, yeah. uh, I hope that some of the folks that were in the group with us get a chance to see this. Um, memory is a tricky thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in court, even in court, eyewitness accounts are, are, are not totally hundred percent credible just because the way the brain is, yeah, we sure. will remanufacture memories, et cetera. And so some people may be pushing back now. Well, then you're making the whole damn thing up. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but fair enough. But you know, you got to talk about these things. Yeah. And in talking about it, you are beginning the process of working your way through it. Right. And uh, I, you know, there's no, there's no other way through it, man. And the, and the marching orders you get in any kind of group like that is to keep your mouth shut and don't tell anybody what you're doing because they would, a, never understand, B, try to destroy you, try to destroy us, and C, some form of hell will happen. Yeah, right. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. So and, fear and, and guilt. And, and to reinforce what you're saying, um, you know, I think on some level, we all want to learn and grow and, and hope for things to improve. And um, I hope so. I hope that's you know, how people so, are. I so, really do. So from that point of view, Talking is a possibility to maybe move towards some of those things. Right. Not talking about it, none of those things happen. I know that 100%. But talking about <laughs> it, maybe you move towards some of those things. And I'll, I'll take that shot than choosing to just bury it. And um, by the way, none of this is really comfortable. Yeah. No. Like, right? No. no of course I mean, even not. though you're sitting here yeah. talking about it and you're very, you know, cogent and all your top, yeah. your points are germane and, you know, you've obviously, you know, walk, worked through a lot of the issues. I know you well enough to know you're not comfortable talking about this. No, no. And, 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 and nor am I at all. I mean, there are like any number of things I'd rather be doing right now than <laughs> talking about this shit. But, you know, to our point, to your point, mm -hmm. it's that important to me and it's that important to you. Mm -hmm. uh, we share that, that yeah. uh, you, you, you can't be quiet about this, man. Yeah. You know, that's how insurrections happen that's how domestic abuse happens that's how that's domestic right. violence happens that's how sex trafficking happens mm -hmm. all these horrible crazy that's how racism is mm -hmm. perpetrated and, and continues on sure you know xenophobia misogyny patriarchy yeah. like it's not cool you know for me like you said you know the trauma doesn't go away um of course not. You know, that's a part of, of, of the makeup of my life, of your life. Of everybody, everybody's got trauma in their life to, to a greater or lesser degree. What I learned is that, you know, through, through all this meditation and, and, and working on myself and therapy, et cetera, is that, you know, we've all got this threshold for how much stress we can handle. And if you can raise that bar, you know, where, where it's down here, mm -hmm. you can raise that bar like, you know, out of frame, right? It's right. just so right. high well then all those things that currently bother you it's like yeah. a blip on the radar yeah and you have a more objective way of looking at it a healthier way of it looking at it you have greater awareness at it and that's you know that's necessarily helpful and um the other thing that i realized was 
although I'm non-religious, which, which is funny because, you know, that was kind of the, the hook. I had interest in religions. And I think you did too, because you've never struck me as a religious cat. And I wasn't raised that way. No, I, you know, my, the only thing at 13, my mother <clears throat> gave us the option of whether we could, could, you know, continue to go to Sunday school. And I'm like, because, you know, at that point, I had the perspective. And, and this, of course, isn't fair because I didn't, really didn't study it. But uh, I think we were Methodist, Presbyterian. But my takeaway was so we come in here every Sunday. Some guy lectures, they pass around a till, the slate's clean, I can do whatever I want, I just gotta come back next Sunday. I'm like, I call bullshit. Sorry, I call bullshit, you know? And I just couldn't get into it. Yeah, I had a very similar experience, um, a very similar experience. Um, but um, to that point, you know, I'm not religious, I know you're not, and, and I thought the same thing. I was like, this is some bullshit. These people don't even believe what they're talking about or what's being told to them. And if they do, they're certainly not practicing it. So what are we doing here? Anyway, that's the idealism part of me. Uh, there is truth to the, to the stories that are in every major religion of being Absolutely. of service. And that those Absolutely. who are the greatest amongst all of us on planet Earth, humanity, are those that serve the greatest, serve the most. And so I started to kind of think about that. And I was like, you know, man, I think that's probably where it's, what it's really all about. And how do you do it without being like sanctimonious or pious or some smug prick? Um, this is how I talk to myself, by the way. <laughs> but, you know, I started to become more socially aware and socially active. Um, I started to try to go and listen to places, to things and groups and people that I've never had had a lot of contact with in my life. And in doing those things, you know, the damnedest thing started to happen is that I had, I got an incredible perspective on my pain, my own little world that I'm, you know, focusing on. And my world broadened and expanded. And it's like, you're not alone. You're not the only person with pain and trouble and trauma and suffering and trials and tribulation. I mean, my God, that person there had this happen and she had that happen. And, and it, it's very healthy and it's very healing. And the, the kicker is, you know, if you stay with it, you know, you're going to help that person grow, that group grow, but really you're growing 10 times more as a person. Um, which, which is kind of like, I thought that was going to happen when I got involved with Freddie. Yeah. Like I thought that's, that was one of the hooks for me. One of it was that, you know, I was going to become self-realized, whatever that meant. That's not yeah. good to me. Yeah. The leaders of the new age, I was like, well, okay. You know, I just kind of went along with that. I, I thought that was some, some bullshit, but um, that, you know, we would be of service to other people like that. That seemed more real and more honest and pragmatic to me. So, uh, and, and that's why I say, like, I, 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 I credit everyone who had the courage to sign up for eternal violence. Yeah, man, you know? 100%. Um, it, there's a lot of people that just would not do that. And uh, so I think there's a lot of admiration. Well, to their, to their credit, I would say. <laughs> but, but you are right, you know. No, to, I'm just saying, to, yeah. So, it's a big we, commitment, man. Yeah, it, it, and, and again, we were being manipulated, but the, the, the perception yeah. was that we were signing up for what you just described. And, and, Correct. Right. and so you, you have to be at a certain point in your life and, and be of a certain kind of ilk to even consider that would be something you go for, you know? And, uh, and I think that's, that type of person is commendable. You know? and, and so the challenge was, as we discovered that what we signed up for versus what it actually was were very, very different. And, uh, and that's where um, the road got, got turbulent. And, uh, and I think a lot of people are still very much trying to figure that out. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, yeah. I don't know what else to say. You're, that you really, you, you put it beautifully today. So hats off to you. Well, thank um, you. Thank nice, you. nicely said. And I'm glad that you didn't listen to me and that you kept, you know, true to yourself and followed your heart and kept running your mouth about this. 
for the oh, past right. 20 years. Yeah. Um, it was, uh, because I know people are going to be hearing this that aren't necessarily in a cult. Mm -hmm. They may be wrestling with uh, alcohol, drug addiction, sex addiction, domestic violence, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it may be. And, and can hear that the dynamic at play, because mm -hmm. it's not about it being a religious cult or a political cult or mm -hmm. whatever. It's the dynamic at play and how your mind can play tricks on you if you're not aware of what it is you're doing, what you want to do, and what's being done to you. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, listen, man, I, I'm going to wrap fight. it up. We're, we're all just fighting the good fight as best we can, right? Try, you know, trying to. I, I was infected with that bug. So, you know, I got to ride this, this one out until my heart stops beating. Um, yeah, because otherwise... You know, I'm not being honest with myself and that I don't want to live like that anymore. That, yeah. that guy was no fun. Yeah, no fun I, I, I hear you. I hear you. So, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for our friendship and what we've endured. We're a pair of uh, survivors and uh, it's been it's been great to have you on that journey. And uh, it's been nice to know it hasn't been alone. So uh, I thank you for that. Brother. Yeah. Thank you. Hoyt. Yeah. It's, I, uh, same sentiments without getting all, you know cheesy or wistful or whatever but yeah i really do appreciate you. you 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 made this a hell of a lot easier than it than it would have been or could have been uh you know you we the funny thing is we were both hell-bent on getting better yeah exactly that's exactly right hell-bent on getting yeah, better and right. like you you know you and, and, and there's no go through and, hell and there's no right or way right or wrong way like we were no. wherever we were at that time in our lives we were just doing the best we could and so uh, yeah, what, what else could you ask of anyone? The effort was there, you know, no, that's, you that's, know, what, ma I'll that's what matters. It, truly. Yeah. You know, I just I'm dovetail it before we end it, kind of end where we started. We're talking about, you know, winding your way through Hollywood and finding a mentor and like, there's no rule book. There's no nothing, you know, you want to be an actor, you want to be a director, producer, yeah. writer, go, go friggin' do it. So, um, you know, here we are. I guess we're kind of uniquely uh, situated or, 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 or we have that experience, the skill set to kind of weave through Hollywood because there is no rule book. It's different for everybody. Yeah. You know, whether you're trying to work your way out of a, uh, a bad relationship or you're trying to work your way into a really challenging industry, whatever it may be. Yeah. Your way is your way. That's right. Hoyt Richards. Appreciate you, man. All right. Love you, brother. We'll Love take you care, man. Enjoy your uh, enjoy the rest of the day, and you know we'll chat again. Right on. Keep on keeping on. See you, all right, brother. Take care. Bye.